go. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Tell the Others with me, Heidi Rogers. And today I'm joined by the lovely Tom. Now, I might say it wrong. I always say Ahern in my head, but I think you say Ahern. How do you pronounce it? Yeah, no, I say Ahern um, because that is the way to say it, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> That's just the way I say it. <laughs> but, I didn't uh, realize that, though, as I was about to say it. I was like, I think I say it wrong because you say it. Yeah. The way it is, not my way, but my head says. Yeah. So yeah, it's all relative. <laughs> Ahern, Ahern is the way. Probably best to say it the way that it is and not the way that my brain sees it. Um, Tom is amazing, and I will let you intro all of the cool things about you. But yeah, why don't you just tell everyone a little bit about who you are, what you're into, blah, 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 all that good stuff. Yeah, well, thank you very much for this, Tidy. It's cool. Um, and uh, I appreciate the compliment that I'm amazing. It's very nice. Um, I, uh, I suppose um, what I do, number one, um, I'm uh, now primarily I would describe myself as a writer because that's what I love to do the most. Um, I love writing about the nature of this unbelievable world that we live in, um, how other people have tried to figure all you know, the basic fundamental life questions out and all that sort of stuff. So very philo philosophically based, um, love psychology, um, and then everything that, you know, is included in psychology, um, you know, how individuals develop and mature, um, and, and all of that stuff. I love the podcast. I love being a podcast host because you get to learn for free and, um, I work as a counselor. Um, so that's kind of my, my job, but, uh, I just, I really try hard to focus all of my attention on what I'm really interested in. And if people want to come along for the ride for that, despite how potentially boring it could be, then I'm very humbled. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, what was, just that makes me think, what was one of your biggest learnings? Like, do you have a podcast guest or a podcast episode where you were like, Oh damn, that was hardcore. I feel like I learned PhD level information in that podcast. Like, you know, those conversations, I mean, I can think of conversations I've had with clients or with friends where you just leave like, whoa, you know, like your brain was just melted because you go, whoa, I've never thought about it that way or mm -hmm. whatever. Do you have, cause you know, the name of the podcast being tell the others is all about like, what's the stuff you would want to tell the others. And you've talked to, how many podcast episodes have you done? Oh, um, so not for the MindMate podcast, but I, I would have done over 400 shows probably about now. So, Dude, so that's 400 conversations with yeah. lots of amazing people. So yeah, your brain would have a lot of cool information in it. So yeah, what, what is one of your things that have, has come just from a podcast? You know, I mean, God, it's such a... That is, that, is, that is a question that I really need to have a think about because okay. there have been, you know, so many. Um, I think one, one thing that really comes to mind, I can't remember anything that he specifically said that, that resonated with me, but, um, you know, different perspectives is so fascinating. There's two actually, and, you know, one of them, both of them are quite strange, you know, in, in, the, in their own cool way. One of them was Colonel Chris Hadfield, who'd been up, who's lived in space, I think for the longest amount of time, um, uh, apart from any other human being. So, wow. and he, he became really famous because he did that David Bowie cover and he filmed it whilst he was actually up in space as well. Yes, um, yes, yes. I remember seeing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's got this lovely handlebar moustache and, and all that sort of stuff. But just, um, you know, being called, this is probably quite um, applicable given the times as well, you know, being, being called into that state of reflectiveness where it's like, just you looking at the pale blue dot, having a think about, you know, because we all look at life from where we are looking up at the stars, but he's up there looking down. And some of what he had to say, I think was really, really fascinating. Um, mm. I think it definitely made me think about how important it is to know my place. Um, that's why I think I'm, I try to make it a, a nightly practice to look up at the stars every night, just to remind myself of perhaps the insufficiency or um, just insignificance of things that I'm really troubled by mm. at that time. Like, Oh, you know, I can't believe I did the dishes like that. Or I can't believe Siobhan didn't. Know. And like, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Just relax. You're a blob of meat mm. just ramming through space. Mm -hmm. And eventually you'll head back in there. And this is like a fun little holiday. <laughs> so 
are the dishes that important? Yes. <laughs> but so that one was, that one was really cool. And the other one I thought was really cool was, um, my friend and I, we interviewed a porn star and she was a spec- she was, I think she was of the hardcore variety, wow. but listening to her talk about how much she enjoyed it, how much like meaning it actually brought her life and, and all of that cool stuff, because you have this very kind of one view idea of what a porn star is and you know maybe they didn't want to do it but that was the only way they could make money or and and here she was saying all these incredibly liberating things like i'm the woman i'm in power this is what i like to do i'm paid way more than the men like that was really i just didn't expect that you know i i thought we went into it open-minded and we didn't expect to have that depth of conversation which i which really was really liberating Hmm. isn't that interesting I'd have to agree with mm. you that sometimes those conversations you have with people where you're expecting it to go one way and then it goes completely different direction um, and sort of goes back to what we were saying before about um, wanting to run interviews or conversations with people open-ended and not having a script or having questions written down that, yeah, I think you leave room, I guess, for more organic stuff or why is it what is that that's I guess it's letting it unfold and not letting your Mm. preconceived ideas or your judgments cloud because yeah if I was interviewing a porn star I would have a whole list of questions that my judgments basically would have assessed and determined that these are the important things to ask but yeah then you get in there and you realize I know nothing (laughs) and this is different than what I thought was important to talk about I guess yeah and i think what's what's difficult about just at listening to as you're talking i think i think what's difficult about listening is that you to really be a good listener um which is something that i'm struggling and slowly getting better at i think but it's it's always progress but like listening you know to be a good listener you have to go into a conversation knowing that little parts of you are going to die you know those little judgments that hold and are the fabric and the glue of your ego are going to die and to be willing to confront that when someone says something that changes your view of the world and yourself it like it's tough because it's like no this is who i am this is the way the world works this makes sense to me when someone says something like you know porn gives my life meaning and you know i feel very liberated from it as one example you know it's just like oh well then what does that mean about me just to a to a proportional degree and i think that's really challenging but it's also a a lovely skill to acquire Mm -hmm. yeah listening is such an art form isn't it it's such a skill and it's such a um i reckon a lot of people think that listening is something they're good at or that they think is like i don't know like a standard thing that like I know how to brush my teeth. And so I know how to be a good listener. And it's like, no, how, how do you like, how would you explain it? Like, so someone's listening and going, I think I'm a good listener. How do I know if I'm a good listener? Or what are the, what are the traits of a good listener? Like, what have you learned either through podcasts or through counseling other people? What are good, what makes a good listener? How is, how is someone a good listener? Yeah, that, that, and, and I think counseling has helped me so much with that. Um, it's because it forces you to do that because like, you know, we live in a world of subjectivity. Everyone has their own different experience. And if you can't listen well in, in the therapy, in the therapy world, um, you're going to go into every specific session thinking that what worked for you will subsequently work for everyone. And that's so not true. And you learn that very quickly or you don't have any money. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. that, that, that's important to, to know. But um, I think um, what, what, makes, what makes someone a good listener, um, maybe even a better question to ask is like, how can you become a good listener? Hmm. And what, what helped me in the, in the beginning was like, what did I want out of the conversation? And I think when you identify as a learner, that implicitly states that you're willing to give up the parts of you that um, aren't willing to go along with whatever the other person who's saying, who actually might be an expert in their field. Mm. And that's what's so humbling about interviewing experts such as yourself. Um, <laughs> you know, all, all these people, it's just like, they know a hell of a lot more than you. Mm. If you're not going to at least um, play around with that, then you're not going to get very far. 
So I think like becoming a good listener um, and that, and that goes well with, with the counseling and the, and the therapeutic world as well. No one knows themselves better than, than themselves. Mm-hmm. So for you to say, Oh, well maybe you should do this. It's like, well, no, they shouldn't. You know, why would they do that? Mm-hmm. Like, why do you think they haven't tried doing that? Like mm-hmm. what's blocking them from doing that? Mm-hmm. You know, um, they know themselves a hell of a lot better than you ever will, mm-hmm. despite what they say, mm-hmm. you know? So I think all of that stuff really helps as well. Um, Carl Rogers um, in the 20th century spoke about this idea of listening. And one thing that really helped me with um, just with my, in my personal relationships as well, was that if I was coming up to, if, if I would find, you know, consistent disagreements or, or arguments presenting themselves or whatever, one thing that really helps me is to um, say to them what I think they were trying to say to me. Mm-hmm. And if, and if I got that wrong, well then obviously it's on me that I wasn't listening. And so then I, I want to be able to try to say back to them exactly where they're coming from. Mm-hmm. So that at least my argument is based off, you know, their own merit, what they're saying. Mm-hmm. Um, so that really helps as well, I suppose. But yeah. Mm-hmm. Mirroring. Yeah. Mirroring back what they say. Yeah. I always say to mm. parents that I work with, um, that that's probably one of my biggest tips for parents is, um, if you're trying to connect better with your kids or you're trying to have less tantrums or less power struggles or whatever, just start mirroring back to them what they're Mm. saying. And that's such a quick way to get kids to feel heard, seen, validated, you know, like, so you want to watch TV now? Is that what you're saying? You know, or you don't want to get your shoes on? Like just validating back, like I heard you and I'll show you how I heard you because I'll say back to you what you just said to me. It's such a, it's so simple. You're so right. It's so simple, but it's such a powerful way to get people to feel heard and seen by just mirroring Mm. back to them. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and it helps you too as well because we're so lost in our own heads, you know, like it's, um, it's, it's so important to validate people like 100%. Um, but then it's also so important that you actually have a, a more realistic scope of the world. Mm -hmm. And if you're missing what people are saying all the time, then you got some work to do. (laughs) Like what's going on in that head. (laughs) Mm But um, yeah, it's mirroring. That's so cool. Like it's, yeah, it works on just both fronts perfectly. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Cause you know how, when you're talking to someone, I have friends like this and I think, well, I think we all have friends like this and family members and colleagues and whatever that, as you're talking to them, you're like, you're not listening. You're just <laughs> waiting for your turn. Yeah. And I can see it. It's like, I can see it in your face. You're not even listening to what I'm saying. You're just waiting, waiting for that gap in the, my speech so that you can then uh, interject with your <laughs> whatever. And it's like, you could, you know, the last line I could say is, and then I murdered 20 people. And then you go, yeah. And so, and like, you're just completely, you know, like bulldoze and not even listen to what, like, dude, you didn't even listen to what I just said. Like, ah, oh, that is so frustrating. That is so frustrating. It is. Why, so actually that's a really good point. Like why, why do you think people do that though? Ego, I think. Yeah. I think that, well, cause you know, ego, I think is all about why we say shit in the first place, you know, like, Anytime mm. when I'm in session with the client and my brain goes bing, like, oh, that makes me think of something, either a personal anecdote or a professional anecdote or research, or my brain goes Wah, with something I want to tell you and something I want to share with you. I run a quick filter. Why? You know, why do I want to say that? Because it makes me look good, makes me look smart. You know, it's ego related somehow that makes my ego feel awesome or it's going to help you, or it's to, you know, help you unpack something or help you see something clear. Um, I have Mm. to always run it through a filter. I think before I'm going to say something, um, with a client, not so, I don't know. I don't do that so much with my friends, like with my friends and stuff, I'll talk, whatever, but with clients, I feel like it's your time, you know, so it's not my time to process my shit. Like it's your time, but (laughs) I think, I think this is an interesting conversation though about ego because I know you love ego work and you love talking about the ego um, just from content and stuff of yours that I've seen. But how do we like, because I think that is a really good point to say what, what relationship or what is that about? You know, like 
So, okay. So if I say, so if someone's listening mm. and goes, I don't even know what the ego means, Heidi, I don't even know what you're talking about. So when I say, I'm thinking of one person in particular um, <laughs> who does this every time I talk to her, she's just waiting to say her, her next line and not listening at all to what I'm saying. Yeah. And so one, I think it comes from ego, maybe a bit of insecurity, mm. maybe a bit of, um, yeah. I want to sound like I know what I'm talking about, maybe, mm. um, which is ego. But yeah, I don't know. What would you say is where do you think that comes from? Or or what should we maybe do some ego 101 and we should maybe explain a little bit what, what we know about ego? Do you want to hit that off? Yeah, sure, sure. No, I, I think it is the ego. And I think um, I think it's good to explain what the ego is because ego has been, um, the Freudian ego has been, people think of the ego as inherently bad, you know, and it's just like, Oh, you know, you've got to check your ego. And sometimes you do. In fact, all the, all the time you do need to check your ego, but at the same time, like to exist, you need one. So we, you know, we need some kind of identity there, there are so many cool, um, um, you know, answers to the question, like what is an ego? Some people say it's, um, I am, you know, what Rene Descartes said, I am, even though we said, I think therefore I am, which is, you know, not essentially true. I don't think so in any way, but it's the, I am, it's the identity. It's the, the pilot of the vessel. Um, it's the, the way you would identify yourself to the world, which is, I think so that's why any word that comes after I am is so important. There's a Buddhist idea that I am who you think I think I am, which is really interesting because it makes you think about why you are the way you are mm -hmm. and then what is influencing you to be that way, which is obviously very, very reflective. And it takes time to, to unpack those layers of awareness because it's scary because, you know, you, you've uh, born into this world as an, as a just potential as nothing, you know, totally dependent. And then eventually you get disciplined and socialized necessarily because otherwise you would run across the street and you'd yell at people. And so we need all that stuff, you know, and then you um, become one of the group at school and then you come out the other side and you shift. It's like, okay, you're done now. You're an adult. And then we're just left with these social attachments and conformities. And then there's no like, you know, there, there's like high school and then tertiary education, but there's no like other that beyond education of, okay, well, now how do we find the individual in you now that you have been socialized and disciplined necessarily because we want you to live and thrive? How do we find that other part that we perhaps lost as the kid, the creativity, the unique perspective, the, the part of you that makes you, you, whether you would call it the soul or whatever you want to call it. We all have that inherent unique expression because we all see the world through a subjective lens and to be able to give that to the world is, I think the essence of what makes life meaningful. I don't think without that, that I mean, you're just a, you're just a sheep, you know, or you're just, you're just a, 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 an animal that lives and then dies. Like, how do we make this world meaningful? It's like, well, we can give our own unique expression um, for the, to the good of the world or something like that. You know, I don't really know, but it's something like that. Hmm. Um, and I think when you're talking about the ego, the ego is just the identity of who you are, but we also want to make sure that who you are, just want to make sure that you know that who you are is influenced by all these other things, social desires, individual desires. So it's like, you know, becoming who you want to be, I think is um, the way to be, you know, attach yourself to a nice ego. I hope some of that makes sense. You know, I'm trying to figure this out as I go along because it's so deep. <laughs> I think what you said a minute ago, well, two things. One, saying it's like, it's malleable. It's something that you can tweak. It's not just, mm. cause I'm sure you would hear this. I hear this a lot from clients. Um, and I think this about myself sometimes. I'm just, I'm not good at, I'm really good at, and we all mm. have these ego-based beliefs about ourselves or the world. All men are assholes. Um, I'm not good with money. We have all of these just sayings that people throw mm. out there, you know, like, oh, this kid, he's so challenging. He's been a difficult kid his whole life. He came out difficult. He was a difficult baby. And now he's a difficult teenager. Like people just have these labels that they just slap on mm. themselves and on others and races and genders and professions. Um, that is all ego, isn't it? 
But what you mm. said a second ago of, um, and so I think you're right that it doesn't have to be that way. Like mm -hmm. it's all subjective, but then also you said, um, that's why it's so important statements that begin with I am and then what follows that. Can you say a bit more about that? Cause I think I learned that, like, I didn't know like, most of us, I don't think come out knowing that, like I learned that in my early twenties that like, Oh, I decide what, <laughs> right. I just thought there was things that I was and wasn't good at and believed or whatever. And I didn't realize that it was yeah malleable. So what, how mm. did you get to that? Or how did you learn that? Or explain, can we unpack that a little bit more for people of what does the whole, I am blank. Why does it matter? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, absolutely. Um, I'd, I'd like to give some um, background as to why a label sticks, because, you know, when you're dealing with semantics, I think it's like, it's all well and good to say that, oh, you know, the, and I write about this all the time, but the power of the label and people are like, oh, yeah, you know, you know, labels mean something. But it's like, I don't think we know how much they actually guide our lives unconsciously. They're seriously, seriously powerful. And um, the reason for that is, you are born again, you know, to, to go back to what I was saying before, you're born in this world and you know nothing and everything is novel and everything is exciting. yet simultaneously fucking scary because anything could kill you as well as anything could be like the elixir of your life, of, of life or the philosophers don't, you just don't know. That's why we need to explore the world. So we put things in our mouths and we're totally dependent on our parents because we need some kind of guiding light, you know, and, um, you know, we put our hands close to the fire and that, you know, burns us. And I'm like, oh, okay, so that, if I do that again, I know that that's the case. And we put bark in our mouths and okay, this is a tree. And, you know, so when we start to separate the world, so, you know, we separate our own consciousness from the unicity to now ego. So we develop an ego because we are seeing that we are separate to the world that we're, you know, perceiving we make these unconscious judgments and, and, and suppositions based upon our exploration. So a tree won't hurt me less, you know, like I saw in the movie, someone stands under it. So I start to get an idea of the way the world works. And obviously because we're not separate from the world, we're living in the world. We also start to make um, unconscious perceptions about the way we are. And that can happen um, you know, to very, very damaging, um, potential, especially when we're young, you know, especially between the ages of zero and seven, when all, when our brain is so malleable and you can say something and, you know, when our ability to rationalize and analyze is, is barely forming, it's not even really formed, you know, um, mine only formed two years ago. <laughs> um, so still falling, but you know, if someone hits you in the face or something, you know, um, you can't separate the, they had a bad day to, uh, they hit me in the face. So mm. we start to believe sometimes that, oh, I'm, I must be a bad person. That's the way the world works. Now, if you take that idea, that judgment, that label with you, you know, as you develop in the world, that idea that I am dot, 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 a bad person, or I am dot, 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 deserve to be hit, or I am dot, 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 wonderful, you know, which is the result of brilliant parenting, perhaps. <laughs> um, that can really dictate your life because things will come at you and you'll have this unconscious idea that, well, are you either capable or you're not capable? So, so much of self-development as an adult is going back in and having a look at how you live your life. But for me, um, that, that happened, uh, you know, traumatically, subjectively speaking, because I was dot, 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 a footballer. And, um, when I was cut at the age of 21, uh, I, so I had to separate myself from my ego and I didn't have a choice because I couldn't make the AFL. So I was no longer um, who I thought I was. And because I didn't know what I know now um, that, uh, it, you know, the ego or identity is malleable or that you actually can be someone else. Uh, I, I just went down the rabbit hole for six years. So I suppose what's been interesting for me for the, you know, up to from 21 to 27 has been learning about the mind a, so that doesn't happen again, and B, so that um, um, I can help other people with it too, because it was my deepest pain. So it's also become my deepest sense of purpose. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Isn't that funny how that always happens, how our pain is what then becomes our purpose, eh? Mm. Um, it's an interesting point you raise about identity, because that's ego, isn't it? Like, um, you know, I always say ego is like 
the voice in our head, or that's what it feels like to me. When I think of ego, mm. I think of the voice in my head that says either, you know, I'm amazing or I'm shit and I suck. Mm. I'm like, it's the same person. And then who am I? The one who sees that. I'm the observer. You know, I observe that stuff. But it's always the ego is the, that shouldn't have happened. They shouldn't have done that. And I think it's a really interesting combo you just wove there of um, identity, ego, and pain. Because interestingly, ego is always involved with identity and always involved with pain and our suffering, isn't it? But that piece about what you just said about the identity you had as a footballer that Mm. you were a footballer. I'm assuming from when you were, you know, five or whatever, whenever you start Auskick to up till 21 of like, this is who I am. This is what I'm good at. This is what I'm known for. This is what I always get pats on the back for is this. And then when that became not good enough, which I think is so fascinating with sport because and Mm -hmm. drama and performance and and acting and stuff like that, where the rest of us, you know, who aren't in a performance-based job or passion, we're never told you're not good enough, right? Mm. But with sport and other things like dance or performance or acting or whatever, you literally are told you are not good enough. Like, it is so harsh. It is so soul-destroying that Mm. you have been told for 21 years you're good at something and probably too big fish little pond depending on where you're playing you're like a gun you know you're like a legend in your town if you're in a little town or whatever and then Mm. you progress Mm. up and then you realize oh shit i'm actually not i'm not as great as i thought i was because i'm now competing against dudes who are twice my size or whatever can you say a little bit about what what was that journey like to go from that identity formation and then at 21 to, I mean, literally told, I can't even imagine how just, de- how devastating that is. But that is yeah, it, it was interesting. It was, it's interesting because like, obviously when you're, you know, there are, there are objective measurements when it comes to team sports or individual sports, because it's like you either make the finals or you don't make the finals. And it's like very clear that a team is um, either good enough or or not good enough. But I think this this is like, this is work where we could, you know, start to take psychology into the sports industry and, and have a think about saying to people, you're the, I mean, the difference between you're not good enough as opposed to, um, this year you didn't play well enough or, or something like that um, is, is huge, is massive, you know? But I mean, I look back on those experiences because obviously it's not, it doesn't have a go at your identity. It has, it has a go more of like your performance or who you could be, which I think is really important because we do need some objectivity in this so that people can progress and, you know, have their ideals and, you know, really chase something, you know, um, which is so cool. Um, but for me anyway, it was because my, I was so attached to it, just like had the tunnel vision on for so long. Mm. And, and I think the big thing for me, because that happens to so many people all the time and people just move on. That's fine. You know, but for me, the reason why um, it shattered me so much was because me playing football was externally validated as opposed to someone playing football as an intrinsic thing. Um, that was, that's a big thing, you know, because, I'll never be good enough now for anyone. So then I'm just a worthless piece of shit. And then that was when the transformation occurred over years, as opposed to someone being like, okay, cool. Well, you know, I enjoyed it because I enjoyed it. And I I'm, I'm now a good football player because I just like to play it. You know, I obviously love to play it, but it was also very much being driven by this need to be someone. Um, Cause I didn't feel for whatever reason, like I was a someone myself. Um, so that was, I think that's an interesting little, um, little tangent there, I suppose, but the, look, the, the first, the first couple of years were just, um, distraction trying to get out of my own head was very anxious. Um, had lots of, um, obsessive compulsive disorder and panic attacks that were stirring from, um, I love this analogy, right? That was stirring from my childhood. So picture the ego was like a boat on the water. And now that, you know, and I was just the captain of the boat. Now that I had no boat, 
I just was drowning and drowning and drowning. And because I was just overly reflective because reflective, because I wasn't steering the ship anywhere, um, things were coming up from my childhood, you know, and I had no idea where these were coming from, you know, very intrusive thoughts related to, um, my sexuality related to this idea that I would, um, develop schizophrenia and go crazy. Um, this idea that I would go to hell and I wasn't even that religious. Um, at, at 21, you know, I'd been raised a Catholic, but I just, I had this intrusive fear that I would burn eternally in hell. And the OCD came from, you know, me picking up rubbish all the time to prove to God that I was a good person. And um, all these, you know, strange things like here I was just walking down this very fine path of AFL, AFL, AFL. And then, oh, okay, I can't be an AFL player anymore. And then within months, it's just like these kind of thoughts coming from, out of nowhere, you know? So for, for years, it was just me trying to pick up the pieces with that. So very quickly, my ego <clears throat> ran away to CrossFit because it knew that when you, the best way to get out of your head is to torture your body. And you've been doing that your whole life. So let's get back in there and do the CrossFit. You know, that works. And I, you know, it's so funny. I'm writing the second edition to my first book right now. And um, reading back, even on that is just this, I, like in my first book, I wrote about how good CrossFit was to get out of my head every day. But looking on that book now, I'm like, that was just distracting myself. So that's really interesting to read back on the, on the, that kind of line of writing. Um, mm. Yeah. The first couple of years was just um, trying to get out of my hurt, own head, try not to be anxious, um, try to medicate, jumped into drugs, um, all that sort of stuff. Um, and then when I hurt my knee, that was the real, okay, Tom, the athlete can't happen. So, my partner and I moved to Bali. Um, I, I, I became slightly psychotic if I was going to self-diagnose myself. Like I, I had very vivid dreams and I was hearing voices. Um, Bali is also a very interesting place to live because it's so quiet and people there are very spiritual. So you get influenced by, you know, the culture. And I, I had lots of interesting kind of like hallucinations and things that were quite, you know, fascinating for me. But yeah, I suppose the, the transformation has just been picking up the pieces and trying to rebuild the ship um, with um, reading books and, you know, pe uh, seeing people like yourself and, and things like that. So yeah, it's been a very challenging, but meaningful time. I think you raise a good point too, about the whole numbing distraction avoidance thing that we all do, especially when we're like early in the work of wanting mm. to, um, run away from our pain, drink, drug, sex, shopping, Netflix, whatever, so that I don't have to acknowledge and look at my baggage and look at my shit. Um, mm. I think we all do that. But I think it's particularly hard for dudes because I think culturally, um, you know, obviously I didn't grow up in Australia, but in America, the culture, and I know it's the same here. I've been here 14 years, but mm -hmm. um, the culture for men is it's not really okay to talk about how you feel. It's at least in Australia, it's always, she'll be right, you know, and it's always, <laughs> that was good. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thanks. Um, <laughs> you, like, don't worry about it. Like it's mm. silly. And then dudes are always told, you know, from such a little age, don't cry. Don't show how you really feel. You got to be tough, macho, all that crap. So what, and then, you know, now the fact that you're counseling mm. and you work with men i know you work with all genders and stuff but like i know that mm. you do see a fair bit of dudes that um yeah mm. what what are your thoughts on that because or, i don't know is this a conversation about toxic masculinity is this about normalizing mental health and stopping the stigma like what do you reckon is the the difference the problem the what we need to shift because if you mm. if we were to go back in time and like take 21 year old you going through all of this stuff and we were to do it now mm. like with what you know now how would you like how would a conversation with 2020 tom look at having a conversation with 21 year old you what would you say differently to him about mm. you know like it's okay to cry like um yeah what what would you say differently or what yeah run with that where do we go with that yeah, uh, that, that is such a good question. Uh, my, my partner and I were actually trying to figure out where that idea that emotions are weak um, came from. 
I don't get it. I, I really, and I'm not saying that because I have some judgment about it. Like I actually don't know where it came from. I'm interested, you know, whether it came from, um, the, the differences between honorable and dishonorable discharges from war, um, because we done, didn't understand the difference between a physical injury and a psychological injury in the 20th century. But then obviously the psychoanalysts were very interested in emotions. Um, you know, the father of psychoanalysis was inherently interested in emotions. So I, I, I really don't understand. I need to research it because it's so interesting. What One thing I would say about, at least what I've found with the differences between like men and women in the counselling world is that there seems to be whether it become whether it comes from um you know socio sociocultural construct or whether there's like a biological underpinning with testosterone being mm-hmm. rampant in, in men there's this idea that's been really working at least in my own experience where helping men find another mission um has been really really good like finding a sense of and we all need it we all need a, a meaning and we need a purpose but whether it's the words mission or purpose, this like idea of like becoming your own hero or something, it's really powerful to, to, to the guys I've been working with. Um, and I think if, cause that's a good question as well. Like what would you say to your younger self? Mm-hmm. I think what I would have said to my younger self is let, let's, let's build a boat at the same time whilst we're swimming in the unconscious waters so that you don't just drown and lose all sense of self and everything is worthless and you're a crazy person. Mm -hmm. Let's give you a mission at the same time so that we can explore both worlds. So like have your feet planted in routine and and habits and and exercise. And it could have been CrossFit, you know, it doesn't have like, sometimes we need little, you know, I say this technically, but sometimes we do need little distractions and things whilst we are, whilst we are dealing with the, incredible uncertainty of exploring the self you know so if you tie a rope to the to a a really strong tree and then go out into the river and explore what you need to explore to find out what's working and what's not working Mm. that would have been really helpful for me at the time because i just went straight into the water and i drowned for like six years so i think that's if i could apply that advice practically i think that would have been helpful Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what I'm hearing too is um, self-compassion and having compassion, like what what you just said said then is having self-compassion and like a grace or a a generosity of you're working it out. And let's just give ourselves some patience here that it's, we're working it out and you don't know, like, I love the saying, um, nobody starts off being excellent. Like Mm. you, you have to get, everyone starts as a beginner in, anything and that's cooking you know fixing your car but also mental health and emotional well-being you yeah. don't just nail it straight out of the gate you learn <laughs> True. you know and you got to have unfortunately it's usually through adversity and through challenge that we learn the painful bits you know um what do you think so what do you <clears throat> think is how would you say to someone like to start? Because I think not everyone is going to have a, I'm 21 and my footy career comes crashing down moment, you know, like what, how do you encourage people to do that self-exploration? Like I remember thinking that like at different times of my life, after I went through my Mm. first big like hell of my early twenties and like just so much pain and suffering and depression and stuff. I remember thinking for years after that, like, universe what do a god what do i have to do to not go through that again like can i just learn yeah. can i learn all the lessons now so yeah. that I don't update, have to... update yeah 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 totally because i don't want to experience pain i don't want to i know you know what would you yeah. say to people that are like well i want to do this work i want to learn i want to grow how do i you know how do i do that where do i start if i want to figure that stuff out where do you tell people to go i mean i always say to people like just follow the holistic psychologist on instagram and that'll get you started but like that'll help that'll that's help. pretty confronting yeah it's pretty confronting but what do you say or what would you do because now you're like at this different place right like mm. so you've had that first big piece of work that you've done of like what you know mind opening blinders yeah. off right now what what 
do you do what does one do to like continue to expand my learning outside of pain and suffering if possible you know yeah well i think um your question's good because you know the the analogy is like i want to do all this work i just don't know where to start um that's good because someone's already on the right path there Mm -hmm. you know for for a, a harder question to answer is how do you get someone interested in this you know because then it's like well they're destined to you know they're destined to fall over if they don't know themselves so, um and that's just inherent to human beings like you can be the most incredible person in the world but if you don't know what's coming up and how you respond to what's coming up and if you don't know your all the, all the things you know um it can be a quite a painful trip as it was for you and you and me my friend so yes that the fact that already want to do the work i think is good but this is such a this was like my expression I don't think it's even my expression, but it was my little slogan for the podcast for so long. Um, the best way to get to know yourself is to spend time with yourself. I just love it because it's so, it's so true. Just find out who you are, like go for a walk, like, and, and don't take anything with you and find out what you think of trees and what you think of birds and what you think of. And then, you know, cause who you are is like your, your mind is kind of like a, an inbox, you know, and if you don't spend time sorting through all the emails and responding to people and, you know, that's going to get pretty bloody clustered and, and busy in there. And we have to give ourselves time to sort through the inbox and go for a walk and sit down reflectively or journal or whatever it is. And slowly we move through all of the, you know, the emails. And if, you, if you're doing that for the first time, you know, there's going to be emails in there from 10, 15 years ago. People being like, can you respond to me already, please? You know you know, analogous to childhood traumas or painful experiences and things like that. So giving yourself time to just be with yourself and learn, learn about who you are and the way you see the world, why you see the world that way. You know, my practice now, that's a really great way to start. And the tools that you can use are journaling, um, an open, honest conversation where you're willing to hear about, you know, your constructive criticism or you actually don't do this all the time and you should probably do that wow, that's interesting. Do I actually not, why do I not do that all the time? I thought I did. That kind of conversation is really good. Traveling is great for perspective. You know, all the, all the, all the usual ones, which are really good. Um, I, I dream journal every morning. It's non-negotiable. Um, I just have incredibly vivid dreams. Um, I remember everything about them. Um, two, three dreams a night. Um, sometimes they're very confronting that's also very cool because I'm like, Oh, okay. I've missed that about myself. I need to do some work over there. Um, so that's really good. Have you trained yourself to remember your dreams? Like, is that a practice that someone could do? Cause I don't remember every morning. Yeah, it, it is. I mean, just having a dream journal, you know, just, um, starting to, say to yourself that you're going to work hard to remember them can be really good. Having a dream journal by your side is a really good little um, marker. But then if I don't, if they don't come to me straight away, then I'll close my eyes. And so what normally happens is, you know, Siobhan and I wake up and you know, the the dogs come running into the room. So obviously the dogs need to come to the room. That's why I need to give them, you know, good morning hugs. And then we will just kind of relax. And then I'll, that's when I'll close my eyes and I'll just let the dreams kind of come back to me. Um, And they'll eventually, and it is a training. You can actually train yourself to lucid dream as well. You can become conscious in the dream. So every time I see a red balloon, I'll remember that I'm dreaming and I'll, and I've had a, a few of those, which are really interesting. Um, cause you can do whatever you want. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, and I need to get better at them and I, I don't really want to, I, I like, I'm going to, can, I can right now, but my dreams are very, there's a lot of, um, reoccurring symbols coming up, which are really fascinating to me. Cause I'm like, okay, that's something that I need to continue to work on. Um, like my dream just last night I was looking I was um my friend was looking down on me um at a you know over a balcony I was looking up at him and then there was this red there was this ball um just like a little dog ball and um it had been thrown down by the forest and I was walking down the forest and um as I was walking further and further down the forest I was being filled with this fear and to the right of me there was this very sacred burial ground that was like um possessed by demonic entities and things. And I didn't want to look there. I didn't want to look there. As soon as I got the ball, I I ran away and and I woke up. Now to me, that makes a lot of sense based upon the dreams I've been having and based upon what my inherent fears are of exploring 
um, the self too far and finding these things. So it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I love to explore dreams because you can really, it's literally like taking a psychedelic every night. (laughs) Um, yeah. So they're really good. That's just what I do. But I think like, um, yeah, spending time with yourself to get to know yourself is is the best way to answer that. Mm. I fully agree, but devil's advocate and having so many clients that in our first, in our first session, it's just like amazing. You're here. Like that is hard to get your ass on the couch, you know, and get to that first session. How do you encourage people to have the bravery to do that? Because I think a lot of people will Mm. say to me, Oh, hell no i'm not going to therapy like friends of mine or whatever or like if i give a presentation and do a public speaking event um you know people might come up to me afterwards and they might say something that i'm like therapy might be good for you but um yeah and you can kind of tell sometimes from people where they're like i don't that therapy's not for me like i will not do that because i don't want to explore myself i don't want to be alone with myself I don't want to think like, and that's why I think um, quarantine and isolation and everything happening right now is so confronting for so many people because they Massive. are forced with their own thoughts. They are alone with themselves for way longer than they would like. They can't go to the pub, go out to eat, distract themselves with friends, booze. I mean, you can still booze at home and stuff, but like, it's different. You can't mm. just numb and avoid time with myself. Like I could pre isolation. So what would you say to the person? Cause I can hear, I can hear some of my clients saying, yeah. I don't want to spend time alone with myself. You crazies. Like that's ridiculous, especially childhood <laughs> trauma people because they'll say, um, and I don't, they, we all have mm-hmm. childhood trauma. Um, we would all say like, I don't want to go there. I've actually have so many people say to me oh, through the years, um, why would I want to open that can of worms? It's fine. I'm fine. My life is fine. If I Mm. do what you're saying, which is spend time with myself to reflect and how do I feel about trees? That's going to remind me of the time I was chained to a tree. That's going to remind me of the time that, you know, so how do we encourage? And it's easy. I think once you've done it and you've either done Mm -hmm. therapy or self-exploration, personal development, and you've come across to go, whoa, it's so much better on the side. Mm. Easy for us to say. But how do we sell it? How do we say to someone who's here and saying it's so much it's so much better over here? I promise you, just trust me, trust me. How do you sell that to someone? Why? Why should I, you know, spend more time with myself and reflect on going for a walk without my phone? Why why should I do that? Yeah. And and that's that's the fundamental question in, in life, you know, why? Um and what helped me was um, studying neuroscience and, and I don't talk about neuroscience to my clients or anything, but um, to, to when you're trying to motivate yourself or motivate someone, what really helped me was to know how human behavior is motivated and it's, it's motivated between two frames, getting away from pain and running toward pleasure and they've studied that in rats, you know, and um, it's inherent to the human animal. So the question why, to help someone explore themselves, which is really scary, um, there has to be a reason, like why do anything other than that, you know? So when someone says to me, because it comes up in my practice all the time as well, it's like, well, I don't really want to do that. Now, a lot of the work I do is around journaling and stuff like that, you know? Um, so it's like, well, I don't really want to go down that path. They may not even say that. I think your point's really good. They might just say, oh, I'm, it's all, I'm all good. And then like on the other side, you can be like, you can see the addiction, you can see the depression, you can see the distractions like, well, and we're all a work in progress. That's for sure. But like that person, everyone needs some kind of self-development mechanism. I really believe that because none of us are perfect and we never will be, but we can be better than we, who, we, who we were yesterday. Mm. Um, so when you're talking about why pain and pleasure, this is something that I really love and I really use it. It's very confronting to, um, and this is why you have to know your client as well, but it's very confronting for someone to have a think about, um, 
what's the best way to say this? Why it's so necessary they do the work, you know, who do you have any idea where this car is headed? If you don't do that work, that's the pain I'm talking about. So it's like, do you know how bad your life could be in two, three, four years time? If you don't start now, that's confronting for someone, but that is motivative. Like fear is very, very motivational. Mm-hmm. You know, if I, if I am being chased by a lion, um, I will run faster than I ever have in my whole life. Fear is very motivational. So to give someone kind of like a, uh, a very realistic future of who they could be if they don't do the work. That is very motivational. I'm not saying that's probably the best way to go about it in the beginning. Mm. Um, and I think fear is actually more motivative than, than pleasure, but I'm not, or desire, but I'm not too sure. But yeah. the other side of that coin is, is, is pleasure. Imagine who you could be if you did do the work and then, uh, and then having a think and unpacking that, you know, this is like getting to, the the root of someone's why what could your relationship be like you know if you did just start to save ten dollars look how much money you have in five years time not i'm not even including the compound interest Mm -hmm. you know like having to think about who they could be if they started doing the work Mm -hmm. i mean it's very subjective and people respond i've had clients that love the fear they just want to jump into the pain. Oh my God, I can't believe I'll be like that in five years time. Mm. I'm ready to go. And that works really well for them. You know, mm. for some kind of bizarre reason, you know, the irony potentially being childhood experience, fear works best for them. <laughs> but fear and, 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 and pleasure, pain and pleasure, um, I think are really good. And if you can apply them to someone's life to motivate them or, and just to motivate yourself to do things. Mm-hmm. I hate um, saving and you know, I hate eating healthily. I really hate eating healthily, mm. but I'm, I'm, I really try to make sure that I'm aware of, um, how important it is for me, given that I've had is- issues with allergies and asthma in the past and things, and I don't want to go down that road again. So I, I try to get all the good foods in. Mm-hmm. And that's then your motivation is the pain that could happen if I don't engage in this pathway. Um, yeah. It makes me think too, what you just mentioned a second ago um, about like different pathways to get to this point and Mm. journaling therapy, but you mentioned earlier too, psychedelics and drugs in general. And I know you have a hell of a lot more experience (laughs) with that than I do. So maybe (laughs) share for, have you done ayahuasca? I've not done ayahuasca. No, Um, no. Um, I'd love to. Yeah, I will yeah. at some point. <laughs> well, let's have a podcast after that so we can. We talk should. About it. Um, yeah, yeah I, I'm fascinated by it and fascinated by psychedelics in general, probably because I've never done them. So I find it, you know, just fascinating. Um, mm. But what could you share? And I guess what is the difference, you know, because you've done EMDR, you've done therapy, you've done lots of personal development what would you say is the best safest? Cause I'm sure we'd have people listening to this going, sweet. I'm just going to go get some yeah. mushrooms. These two professionals <laughs> just said I can do some mushrooms, spend some time with myself and I'm sweet. Like <laughs> yeah. what, what would you say to someone about like, what's the best safest, you know, what maybe whatever you feel comfortable to share of what you did get out of some mm. of your, cause I think you have one of them is in your, your first book, I think where you talk about, a very powerful trip that you had. Um, yeah. What? Yeah. Go, go nuts. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, that, um, uh, there was a couple of experiences on mushrooms in the first book and MDMA, um, ecstasy is a, is a nut. It features in the, um, third book. Um, and then, um, EMDR with you mm-hmm. is in my second book with breath work and, um, an acid. So <laughs> try to try to jump nice. around all, I try to hit all bases. <laughs> um, Taking one. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. And um, I haven't done psychedelics <clears throat> anywhere near as much as like the real psychonauts have, you know. Mm. <clears throat> but um, I'd, I'd very much like to. And I think um, the biggest thing with any of this stuff, I would say, if if you're interested in starting out, and I'm not an expert, but I would start off with something that you can do that's endogenous. So it's in your own body. So EMDR and breath work, I think are the the best things to um, evoke that altered state of consciousness. Mm -hmm. To me, 
our session together on EMDR was no different to a three to four gram dose of mushrooms. What wasn't any different. And the fact that it was guided was very transformative because you don't just want to go into a psychedelic trip and be like, oh, okay, here we go. I did that on about 10 to 12 grams of mushrooms when I was 18 and it ruined oh. me. Yeah. I didn't mean, I didn't even know I was having that much, but we figured it out because the, the mushrooms were so heavy and potent and they were being grown up North that we did it. And you know, I was, I was very unaware of myself. I'd been drinking that whole week on schoolies and me and my mate did it just for a night out. And the first couple of hours were absolutely harrowing. I remember closing my eyes and falling down a void for return for eternity. And then at the very end to find myself in a locked, jail cell with my mum 50 meters tall and wide looking down at me with the eyes of shame that could only be seen by the devil like it was shocking oh my shocking God. <laughs> yeah it wasn't um it wasn't but I, again at the other side of that i learned uh, a hell of a lot about myself um and that it needs to be guided. You know, that, that, that same idea of you need to tie your rope to the tree so that you can sift out into the water and explore. Mm -hmm. um, without a strong foundation, um, it can ruin you. And I think um, that trip really led to a lot of the um, intrusive thoughts and things that came out when I lost my identity because I had no means to distract myself from mm -hmm. those things anymore. So they were like, here we go. And um, Carl Jung writes about how when you lose your future orientation, the riverbed of the past overflows into wakefulness. And that was the same idea. It was very congruent because it was the same idea. Now that I lost, now that the walls were no longer like this and my um, perception of the world and of the self was a lot wider, everything that wasn't, hadn't come up was overwhelming all the time. And, um, you know, I, I was bedridden for a lot because it was just, I couldn't do anything. I was just like this all the time. Wow. <laughs> um, yeah, but I think EMDR and breathwork are the, the, the most, um, they're, they're the, you know, and if you have a good therapist like yourself, and I'm obviously biased, but like my partner as well with breathwork, mm. someone who re has, 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 has knows it back to front, mm. can guide you safely. And when we say safely, we almost, yeah. we also mean guiding you through what you need to move through as well. Safe isn't here we go. Let me protect you. It's like, I'm going to hold your hand whilst you go through yeah. hell, you know, cause it's necessary. Yeah. Um, it was incredibly transformative. And I, when, when we called the day after yeah. my dreams were really interesting. Um, cause I hadn't had the altered ending to that story. Um, I just had the same dream for years. And then with EMDR, the, there was an altered ending like a goosebumps book. So that was really cool. Yeah. But doing something, that comes from your own body first. And then I think if you're interested and what, what people, what they're doing in the States now where they're starting to train people to be, you know, psychedelic assisted therapists mm -hmm. is, is really cool because God, I mean that trip on MDMA, on MDMA was fascinating. Like seeing all different aspects of my own consciousness, um, you know, mediating and resolving conflict. And there was a young me being loved unconditionally by this love ball that would just, hold me every time a manifestation of a past fear would come up. Um, that was really interesting too, but it's also illegal. So <laughs> <laughs> there's that. There's exactly. That. Um, I always found it interesting when I read um, Steve Jobs biography, the Walter mm -hmm. Isaacson one um, and lots of other prominent visionaries. Um, Elon Musk, I think, was recently on Joe Rogan and sort of had a similar conversation about the benefits of psychedelics and just how acid, just like so many different things can come from it of just expanding your consciousness, your awareness, creativity. You know, Steve Jobs was always nuts mm -hmm. about how, you know, he said, you know, LSD wouldn't, if I hadn't have done LSD and so much of it, you know, a lot of the concepts and things I came up with or the, like the visions that I had for business or products or whatever wouldn't be here without, you know, that stuff. Um, I always think too of um, the movie with Bradley Cooper, Limitless, you know, where mm. you just sort of go, what is there within our brains and our capacity and stuff that we don't even see these rooms that we haven't unlocked in our own minds. And then the drugs help do that. Do mm. you think that there is, um, 
yeah, like, I don't know. What are, what are your thoughts on that when, when people say, like, it makes me more creative or it, I wouldn't have had the success business-wise or creatively with my music or whatever if I hadn't done the drugs? What are your thoughts on that? Like, Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> it's a great question. Um, and this goes back into the necessity for guidance because we have painted in the contemporary world um, mind expansion as this inherently good thing. But, um, and this goes down to the most fundamental um, questions of life when you're talking about, and, and I'm going to take it there. <laughs> um, nice. But when you're talking about good and evil, um, you know, all, all that sort of stuff and how everyone, you know, the, the similarities between like yourself and me and Hitler is that we're all human, mm -hmm. which is not a nice thought, but um, it is true. And when people talk about, oh, you know, psychedelics have this incredible creative capacity and all this sort of stuff. The, the thing that I learned, I'd done mushrooms before and had some really cool experiences, but the thing that I learned when I had that really bad trip was that mind expansion isn't necessarily all good. In fact, for me, it was very, very, very bad because I learned about things about myself that I did not want to learn. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't want to know that past experiences really, really negatively affected me. I didn't want to go back into that. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't, I didn't even know I didn't even want to go back into that, mm -hmm. but it was all there. And then this exploration of like the, you know, how um, sh ashamed I felt of my life and how gross I, th I thought I was and embarrassed and how, why I was, how much of a mess I was and how much of like I was craving the love of my dad and being externally validated. And like that, that all, that was just like despicably painful to, to go into. So like limitless is a great movie because it's like you take this drug and all of a sudden you can do all these wonderful things. Psychedelics are kind of like that, but psychedelics, this is why the, the healing has to come first, I think. Mm -hmm. and, and it always mm -hmm. has to happen because like you, you learn things that you don't necessarily want to learn. You know, that's like when you read a book or when you have a, an open conversation, like you might say something to me and I'll be like, oh, that means I've got to rethink like my mm -hmm. whole perspective on that. You know, and like that's not fun. Change isn't always good. Change can be really tough, mm -hmm. especially the changes that with something like a psychedelic shows you that you have to make. And that's really painful. So mind expansion is simultaneously good and bad. And you need to have some kind of, um, all the mythological tales spoke about the psychopomp, the guiding light, um, you know, um, Virgil to Dante in Dante's Inferno, the, the thing that moved him through all the pain. What is the reason, the, the raison d'etre that's moving me through all this? Like, why am I doing all this for something? And um, whatever that light is for you, um, that that should be enough to, to, to make you want to go through the, the pain so that you can come out the other end. Mm. What is that for you? Because I think it's different for all of us, you know, the why, you know, and those of us that are like pro therapy, pro self exploration, like, okay, to put ourselves in uncomfortable situations, have hard conversations. It's maybe easier for us to answer, <clears throat> like, we don't shy away from that kind of stuff. But not everyone does. So I think it's, cur it's, I'm curious about that. Why? Why do we because it feels a bit sadistic in a way, doesn't it? Like mm. I'm going to put myself through pain or I'm going to, I'm going to go there, you know, cause a lot of people would go, mm, no, thanks. So yeah. yeah. What, what's that for you? Why go there? Why do that to yourself? Yeah. Well now, now that I've had time to think about it um, and Victor Frankl um, said it could come from free areas. It was good deeds, um, challenge. So suffering and then love. There were, there were his three ideas and he was obviously in the nut concentration camps. Um, so he knew a fair bit about suffering. Um, but what got him through there was the fact that he wanted to write um, the book that became one of the ones, um, Troubles, I can't remember what it is. Mm. It, he wasn't Man's Search for Me. But for me, um, I think it's love. I think mm. it's love. I think um, I wrote a poem and I haven't actually said it to my partner, um, but I wrote a poem called um, The Man You See. And um, I cried a lot when I, when I wrote that because I, I really felt it was very true. And um, I feel like when she looks at me, um, I see, uh, she sees like potential or she sees like the very best that could be in me. And um, it's such a lovely thing because 
I'm getting emotional just thinking about it, <laughs> but um, having a, having, having someone look at you and, and think about you could be um, not that you could be so much better than you are, but you're doing well and you could be even better is so motivational. Um, and um, you know, she doesn't just look like, look at me like that, mm. obviously when, mm. when, when, <laughs> depending yeah. on what normal is, yeah. but um, I really, really love that. And when I do all my writing, cause I write, you know, four or five hours a day. Um, so that's very meaningful for me as well, just to learn and write and express myself. But um, and there's like a, a suffering component to that, I suppose, because you have to sacrifice a social life to agree to a degree, I suppose. But um, it is, I think it is love that motivates me the most because I've never felt so comfortable being who I am, knowing that I could say, do or anything and come back home and the hug would be the same. So, mm. mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. It's true, isn't it? Like that, um, knowing that you, in the eyes of someone, are enough, just as you are, mm. and that they always believe the best in you. So like, even if you did something that hurt her or upset her, the lens that she would go into the situation with her, you know, talking to you about, hey, you did this thing, it hurt my feelings or whatever, knowing that she goes into that with a lens of, I believe the best in you. I give you the benefit of the doubt. I know your heart. You're not a bad person. You weren't trying to hurt me. If you did, it was an oversight or, you know, an intentional byproduct of something else. Um, it's powerful because I think a lot of us aren't raised like that. I think a lot of us mm. are raised very conditional parenting, very conditional mm. love. And it, um, which I think is neat when we can kind of, heal that wound or get that need met through our partners by having someone who believes the best in me rather than, yeah. Or having an insanely high standard for me that I just can't reach that I'm never good enough, you know, like. Mm. Hmm. Yeah. It, it is because it's like um, love. And, and also, you know, one thing I try to say to people as well is like, you know, and I, I love all different interpretations, but for me, the idea of the soulmate, is very impractical. <laughs> like, it's just like, well, fuck. I mean, there are like 8 billion people out there. You want me to like travel to Norway and see if I can, excuse me, are you my soulmate? Are you my soulmate? Like how long is that going to take? You know, for me, it's a very practical idea of, um, you know, find someone who's like a real babe and then show up every day, you know, great. That really works for me. So it's like, it's something that's cultivated, you know, but that you, I think you're really right too. you know, that seeing some like coming to know someone that looks at you and just says, you, you know, you are enough, you know, and, um, and also you're enough happens to be something I really like is really cool. Cause it's just like, you seem to really like me, even though I don't really like myself. Mm. Now, when you're doing all that reflective work, it's like, by definition, the way I interpret the world isn't the true way the world is, but to see someone like that. And I'm just thinking as I go here, which is something I like to do, but to see someone look at you like that is like, okay, why do you love me this much? Like given that everything I know about the world is wrong. Um, sorry, or isn't, isn't all the way the world is like, there must be something I'm missing here. Um, and, uh, yeah, I don't know. I'd I'd like to reset like, read a bit more about that idea, but Mm -hmm. it seems to me like, um, having a loving relationship and like, obviously all the poets and things, all the romantics, they all talk about how love is all there is and all that sort of stuff and Mm -hmm. whatever. But, um, it's definitely a nice feeling. Mm -hmm. It is. I think Mm. sometimes too, that's a fundamental role that a therapist plays or a counselor plays. Yeah. Um, I definitely have had that with clients where I'm the first person in their life that thinks they're awesome or I'm the Mm. first person in their life that believes the best in them or believes you're a good person. Um, because maybe the things that have happened to them make them think that they're not worthy and that they're filled with shame or maybe the things that they've done. I know like when I worked in prison, that was something I saw a lot. Um, Mm. just that inherent I'm bad. I'm not okay. Um, I'm not enough stuff that I think sometimes in therapy that's, where it starts and one of the kind of beautiful things that therapy I think is amazing for is the, just the relationship and not necessarily heaps of the personal 
epiphanies and self-exploration that you get out of it. Sometimes I think it's just the relationship of having another human being <clears throat> who sees me, hears me and loves me, not despite my imperfections, but because of them, like yeah. I have another human being who I, they've heard all of my stories They've heard all of the horrible things I've done. They've heard all of the horrible things that have happened to me. And they still look at me with those loving eyes of like, you're amazing. And wow, mm -hmm. I'm so inspired by you. And how'd you get through that? <laughs> yeah. And I love our time together. Like I think mm. so many times I've heard clients say like their brain was just blown by the fact that there was this other human being who would hear all of the horrible things they did. And it didn't change my opinion of them. And, mm, absolutely. Oh, it's so powerful. I think, especially for, we don't pick our family and sometimes we don't pick our friends, you know, like the people who we're friends with up until 18 is kind of by circumstance of where we go to school and we don't have much control over it. But then later you can pick your friends. But I think for a, a long time we are forced and surrounded by people that don't get us or, you know, whatever that I think sometimes therapy or a counselor can be that for other people that you can be mm. that person who um, like loves you no matter what kind of thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I just don't think people are inherently bad. I've never met someone that's genuinely a bad person that chooses to be bad. So maybe some people choose to be bad, but it's actually because something really bad has happened to them and that's shaped their worldview. So, and I think, you know, when you're on my show, I think what you were speaking about having done all that work in prison couldn't be even, it couldn't be any more true because you've seen the extremes of what can happen to people, but being able to see that this is why trauma in, in, in informative work is so brilliant. It's so brilliant because it's just like, wow, people aren't bad people. People can sometimes become that way, but they're still trying to fight for some kind of thing. There's still a, like a, a God in them that just can't, find its way out mm. under all the rubble of pain, mm. you know, um, and you really see that that's not a woo woo thing to say, like it's really true. Mm -hmm. And if they go into the, that stuff guided by mm -hmm. a light of a therapist or someone that is like, has done it before with other people and themselves as well, mm -hmm. I think that's a big thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, you know, hopefully, um, it can work out. Mm. Because with, I was just thinking about when you said, I don't believe people are bad. I agree. I don't believe people are bad either. But there's a shitload of religions out there that believe it. I mean, yeah. what's one of the basic Christian tenets is we're all born sinners. And, we're mm. all, and what's a sinner? Bad. And so I think so many religions, I mean, I can't speak of lots of other religions because I haven't, you know, studied them extensively. Um, but I know at least with Christianity, you know, one of the core things is that we're bad and that we need to, you know, pray for forgiveness and we need to repent and that kind of stuff because we're just inherently bad. And I just find that so hard to wrap my head around. And I find it's so tricky, I think, to come from like the shame based end of the spectrum that I am bad, not what I did was bad or the behavior is not okay, but I am bad. Me. To start mm -hmm. there, I'm just like, oh, damn, like, you got a way to go, man. Like, you're just, you're starting literally at the hardest point of the spectrum that I think yeah. is total bullshit. I don't even think that's true. I think we're all born good and we're all born inherently kind and full of love. And I think that gets beat out of us in school and culture and environment and conditioning and blah, blah, blah. But yeah, what would you say to that? Because like... A lot of people don't believe we're born. A lot of people believe we're born bad. Yeah. Well, that, that's a good question. You know, I just wrote about original sin in, in the book. Did so you? that's, cool. yes. Yeah. That's a very good question. Um, look, the religion stuff was a big thing for me, you know, for, cause I was raised a Catholic, um, you know, derivation of Christianity. And um, when you know, my mental health declined. I developed that sincere belief that I would go to hell because I was a bad person. Mm -hmm. And I have no idea where that came from. I still haven't pinpointed the exact moment. You know, with most of my other traumatic experiences, um, 
I can remember the thing they came from, mm-hmm. whether it was just like a gradual indoctrination, you know, it could have been that, but, um, I, I moved into aggressive atheism and started, and I just fell in love with, you know, Dawkins and Hitchens and mm-hmm. Harris and, you know, love their books and just mm-hmm. felt, you know, mm-hmm. and I love the idea still today because it's critical thinking, which is good. Mm-hmm. You should be, you should think about everything that you believe to be true. That's why there's a tattoo here that is Latin for um, seek the seek your own truth, nullius awesome. in verba. Awesome. So I had to put that on there to never forget that. But you know what was so interesting was um, I read a quote later by um, a philosopher from the 18th century, and he said that religion is too too um, iconic, too profound, too significant for so many people for it to all be ridiculous, mm. and I think the other thing as well is to move from one side of fundamentalism to the other. You haven't really done a whole lot of insightful work there, you know? So I went from, okay, well, there is a God and all that sort of stuff to there is no God. It's all bullshit. Everyone that follows are fucking ridiculous. I'm like, okay, maybe both sides are wrong here. Tom, you being the manifestation of those, let's go into the work here. So the second book I'm writing is about mythology and religion, you know, from a psychological perspective, perspective mm-hmm. because um so much of it needs an update um and i'm not saying that i'm the one to do it people have done it basically when i talk about this book it's just i've just read people's interpretations that i really like and i've extrapolated on their ideas mm-hmm. i'm by no means doing anything here that's you know you know making the new wheel or whatever it is um but one of the ideas that because i hated that idea of original sin but one of the ideas behind it that kind of made me, I suppose, a little bit more um, uh, forgiving or compassionate to that idea was I I read the the Old Testament, studied the Old Testament. um, And it was, again, completely through a psychological lens. It's not fundamentalism. I don't believe that any of this stuff historically happened. I think um, I don't even know if the people that wrote it believe that. It's just that people on either side of the extremities just take it because and you can also be forgiving to them because, which, which is really hard to do by the way, but to the degree that a belief system gives someone meaning, who would they be without their Christianity given like how detrimental their worldview is to people. Um, yeah, I just, I really want to try to do my best to see where people are coming from. Now, if one of them came and spoke to me, we'd be trying to do some work around that. <laughs> <laughs> But <laughs> yeah, I think yeah, one thing exactly. um, when I, because I was raised Christian, but not super hardcore. Like we went to church on the weekends, and then I converted when I was thirteen to an evangelical Christian um, church, and mm. then was hardcore into that through high school, and then into college, and then through the whole depression and all that shit left the church because if yeah. just learning more and kind of doing the bad, not okay things and then seeing how that was received and then discovered Hitchens and Dawkins and stuff like that. And my brain was just like, whoa, there's this whole other world. And Mm. I love both of them so much. And all of their books Mm. have just literally had such an impact on my life. I'm with you on that. But Mm. I think this is maybe something for us to share with listeners is if you're curious about that, just watching some of their debates. Oh my Lord. Watching some of their debates on YouTube changed my life like yeah is growing up i think with church stuff and bible stuff pumped into your head the way that they because they're so smart and they're so much more researched on that stuff than i am but to hear them explain why that's not possible or why this is how that could have been meant or how this could have been translated or whatever it's just like were those your first books that you kind of opened your brain for religious stuff or christianity wise they, 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 they were, they, they, they were the books that I started to read. Um, so there is some hypocrisy with them though, I suppose, because so like, uh, I went through the God delusion. Um, God is not great. <laughs> um, and then I really fell in love with Hitchens because he's just so, so 
provocative mm-hmm. and he, he, yeah, he was really good. But when, when I was watching them debate, I, I started to skew back into the, the more compassionate side because okay. here they are really extrapolating on all these ideas and looking at God and religion through a literal lens mm. and they're really opening up their critical, critical faculties. But then when they debate with someone who is religious, they're so dismissive yeah. of it. And this goes back to what we spoke about in the first part of this conversation. Listening mm-hmm. is the idea that you need to be open-minded. And I looked at that and I was like, well, what, now what are they missing? How can someone believe this so much? And then, and then someone else believe this so much. Yes. And I think the issue that they do, and I still love them to bits, but they, they take on the side of an argument that a 10 year old could take on. Mm. So when I was 10, or I think even earlier, and I think my mum did the same thing, you know, is, is Santa real mum? Is God real? That's the same question that they're doing. They just have all these evidence against the literal truth. Mm-hmm. And that's really good because it opens your mind up being like, Oh, okay. There's, I mean, who knows if Jesus was historically a person, you know, who knows if Abraham was, or if Muhammad was, or if, you know, all, you know, who knows, but then, you know, Christian liberals to, to speak about Christianity, mm. take on the, um, the, the side of morality. It's like, well, what they stood for. Okay. Well, that's really interesting then as well. But then, but well, how do you explain original sin and all this sort of stuff? It's like, then you've got to go into the, the deep work. And um, I think if you can, if we can find a level of balance where it's like, we know it's not historically true. Everything you read is obviously culturally, um, determined and lots of people thought women were like that and gays thought like that. And, you know, we also thought that, I mean, we also, our conscious, we weren't anywhere near as smart as we were today. And Mm. childbearing was incredibly challenging and often came with death. Like that's shocking. So when you read something like, um, you know, and, you know, a child, you know, for a woman to have a child is incredibly suffering. It's just like, we have to remember how, how they live their lives and saw the world. And when someone says, you know, oh, this is the way it is. It's like, no, it's not. It's the way it was for them, Mm -hmm. which is still bad. (laughs) We're slowly moving away from that, you know, but um, so one, you know, you you mentioned original sin Mm. as example, and I hated that all the time. And then I, you know, I started writing about it and that idea of original sin comes directly after Adam and Eve ate the apple from the, the truth of the the tree of the good and evil. Mm. And what I think that, meant to me and it's not just me from what i've read as well is that when you when you're when the veil is lifted and you can peer behind the curtain and the knowledge of good and evil manifests itself to you mm-hmm. akin to what i was saying when i had the psychedelic trip is that you now know that you could be bad mm-hmm. as well as the fact that you could be evil so the original sin is unless you're got from the Christian perspective, because it is from the Christian perspective, unless you're guided by um, the spirit, the way, the truth, truth, speaking the truth, you know, mm. things that bring out the best in someone, you, the, proc- the proclivity for you to be evil, um, I suppose is, is much more um, significant. Mm-hmm. But, but again, even if, if I say that, that's taken me years to try to get to, mm-hmm the way I was taught it was that you're a bad person and you need to be baptized. And it's just like, damn. (laughs) So this is why I'm so interested in mythology and stuff, because it's like, now that I've looked at the atheist perspective, now that I've looked at the psychological significance of the religious stories, it's like, I I would be so wonderful that we could teach this stuff to, to kids because I also think it's good to know that, um, I mean, I could go out there and just kick my dog right now for barking. I don't want to do that because I want to be a good person. But to know that that kind of like ego thing in me exists is to be very mindful of it. And I think when you're very ignorant and you're very unconscious of the proclivity for you to be bad, that's when the unconscious projections come about. Um, And they did for me as well. So kind of knowing that little... Maybe it's why I'm a little bit more dictated to the pain to motivate me, <laughs> but that stuff can, um, and kind of like, I think be really helpful, but we need to teach it in a way that's, that's modern and updated. You know, totally. we, we don't see that. Totally. I think it would be, God, so amazing if we could change the like curriculum for kids in school. 
Mm, that absolutely. They, that they could learn some of this stuff or that they have, you know, as part of their core topics of math and science and stuff that they mm. learn social emotional well-being or that they learn mindful i mean a lot of schools are doing mindfulness programs but i feel like yeah that's tip of the eye it's great like it I'm better than nothing but like I'm with you. iceberg yeah. man like there's needs totally. to be an hour at least every day where we're teaching social emotional skills and awareness and yeah dude totally emotional skills i mean that's got to be everything like you can, you can talk about religion and mythology and morality, you know, but like teaching a kid what anger feels like, you know, it's like, like really that's that what you're feeling right now. That's anger. What does it make you want to do? You know, it's like, Oh, what makes you want to do all these things? Like, wow. Amazing. Now we can, we can put that, we can filter that productively, you know, but if we don't teach kids like what sadness and anger and pain feels like all these things that we are going to experience, I mean, how do you expect any less of them than to go through mental health issues and to, you know, do the worst things that human beings are capable of? They don't know what they're doing. We've, we've been lying to our body ever since we were, we were told that, you know, don't, you don't need to be afraid of public speaking or whatever, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And anger, especially, I think that I'm actually working on, um, I'm doing a webinar in June on anger. And so I'm right now doing all the like research and reading about it and trying to sort my own anger out and, um, <laughs> yep. little, little light work right there. Just easy. <laughs> it only take me a week or so to just nail that one down. Yeah, exactly. But, yeah. um, <laughs> reading, you know, Thich Nhat Hanh, reading all sorts of Buddhist stuff, reading, more contemporary stuff, Harriet Lerner, the dance with anger, reading all this other stuff to learn about anger. And um, mm. it's fascinating that it's such a different emotion. It's so different than the rest of them. It's this one anger, like, and especially when you say in children that triggers parents massively. And it's this really suppressed, shut down, go to your room till you sort out your attitude don't speak to me like that. You mm. know, um, it's so, it's such a fascinating emotion that you're right. Like, can you imagine if we had anger, you know, you say to a kid, so what are you studying? Anger 101. Yeah. What are you studying this semester? And they're like, Oh, I've history. I have, you know, maths and I have um, biology and anger. And, you know, yeah. can you imagine if we're educating kids, just even like you said, teaching them like this is the word for what you're feeling, emotional literacy, you know, teaching them what your feelings are. But then also, yeah, so what? That Now what do I do with it? Nobody knows. Adults don't mm. even know. And why don't, you know, why don't adults know? Because their parents didn't teach them. And so, you know, you look, at, you look at all these kids that have anger issues or, you know, oppositional defiance disorder or behavioral issues. And it's like, Dude, it's just because they have an emotion that no one has taught them how to manage. And that's because all the us, all the grownups, we don't know how to manage it. I certainly don't. Like, I'm a lot better mm. than I used to be and better than, um, you know, probably the, the average, whatever that means, because I've spent mm -hmm. so much time, money, and therapy <laughs> reading <laughs> into it to figure it out. But, yeah. like, it's such a, it's such a skill. Like, and to say, like, I understand my anger and I know how to work with it. Like, dude, that, so that's far. Like, oh my God, that's like a lifelong journey, like to get that. It's not like, I don't know how to make a lasagna. You don't just like read an, an you know, recipe and then you just do it. Like, whoa, so true. anger it's is so, such so a challenging, beast. such a beast. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that helps me from context is to, to understand, you know, how we respond to novelty and uncertainty, fight or flight. You know, so some, when I'm angry, I try as hard as I can to override the mammalian brain and remind myself that I'm actually just afraid. Mm -hmm. So like if I get really angry at my partner or the dogs or something, I'm like, okay, hang on, I'm just afraid. I'm afraid. And that really humbles me because I'm like, oh, okay, fuck. Because my anger just wants to be like, listen, you know? <laughs> but um, yeah, I need, I seriously need that to take that 101 class. <laughs> <laughs> I'll send you the link when it's done. Yeah, please. <laughs> It's just, it's such an interesting one, anger. I'm very fascinated by it and I'm very fascinated by it now when I see it come up in me or when I see it in my kids or when mm. they trigger me. It's so, it's so interesting. When I'm in it, I'm not like, this is interesting. When I'm in it, I'm like, you know, but 
Oh yeah. Reflecting <laughs> on it. Yeah. Reflecting <laughs> on it. It's really interesting to look at because it has such a different um, perception. People respond differently than any other emotion. You know, even shame, shame elicits a different response in us than anger does. Anger is just a completely different beast. But mm. um, Hey, thanks, dude. This was a fun chat. This was neat. It's too. always a pleasure. Yeah, it's neat to chat about all this stuff. So where can people find out more about you if they want to work with you in private practice, if they want to follow you? What's all your, what's your jam? My jam is uh, just Tom Ahern, um, A H E R N. <laughs> it's not O apostrophe Batman symbol Q. <laughs> um, so that's me on all the socials. Um, I'm putting a bit more work and effort into the podcast now because that's really my baby. I love the podcast. So the Mind Makes Podcast. Um, you can listen to our show together, mm-hmm. which is brilliant. For everyone that doesn't know, um, Heidi and I met in a profound professional setting first off which is awesome and we've become friends um after that which is a a lovely addition so um yeah but that's where you can find me i suppose cool well thanks man and um i guess i will send you all of this when it's done so you can share it with all of your people too because this is fun to cross our little worlds together but um thanks man and um we'll see i'm sure we'll do this again so i will see you at the next one Absolutely. Yep. All the time. We'll just keep, we'll keep rotating through. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks, dude.